Did you know that the modern U.S. aircraft carriers are capable of serving for more than 75 years while remaining relevant for almost any given mission? The USS John F. Kennedy, also known as CVN-79, is one such long-term investment held by the U.S. Navy whose capabilities are regularly improved even during the construction phase. But what unique solutions will allow the military to keep such a colossal project afloat, both figuratively and literally? We'll be trying to answer that very question in today's video. Aircraft carriers are over 100 years old. The original concept of using them as the eyes of the Navy to detect enemy ships using aircraft was shattered by the Imperial Japanese Navy during World War II when it combined several aircraft carriers with 400 aircraft on board into a single strike force, Kido Butai with more range and capabilities than dozens of battleships. The attack on Pearl Harbor, in which six Japanese aircraft carriers simultaneously attacked the U.S. Pacific Fleet in Hawaii, went down in the history books as a prime example of the use of these ships as the centerpiece of war and instantly brought aircraft carriers to the top of the naval hierarchy. Since then, many lessons have been learned, and large-scale nuclear aircraft carriers have become the signature expression of American military power. It's these titans that allow the U.S. military to carry out devastating air attacks against enemy forces on land and at sea for weeks and even months on end, accurately striking hundreds of targets in a mere one day. Moreover, unlike other combat platforms, their advantage lies in the absence of mandatory access to bases on the shore in order to effectively complete assigned tasks. Wherever these floating military islands go, they remain sovereign American territory whose actions are not limited by anyone except the U.S. authorities and by their opponents to some degree, of course. This advantage was especially noticeable in the case of the Israel-Gaza crisis in 2023. The problem is that although U.S. bases are located all over the world, their coverage is not uniform. For example, the closest American air base to Israel is in Chirlik, located in the same area of the Turkish city of Adana, 300 miles from Israel. This means that planes flying from there will have to fly past hostile Syria and its air force. Flying over this area would require traveling an additional 100 miles accompanied by fighter jets, making reaching Israel even more difficult. Not to mention that the Turkish authorities may also have sharply opposing views on such flights. On the other hand, American aircraft carriers can be in international waters off the coast of Israel and come as close as needed. The only risk in this situation is the threat of Hezbollah using anti-ship missiles. However, four squadrons of F-A-18EF fighter bombers, or even more recent F-35s, can receive a continuous line of communication with any point on the coast of the eastern Mediterranean, and U.S. authorities can safely give them orders to engage in battle without the need to coordinate actions with the host government. Aircraft carriers perfectly illustrate the big-stick ideology voiced by the 26th President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, according to which you need to speak softly and carry a big stick. No other weapon system or combination of small systems existing or on the drawing board is as lethal, flexible, and resilient as a giant nuclear-powered aircraft carrier with its own air wing. What's more, the main gem in the strategic crown of the U.S. Navy, which sports the 11 important aircraft carriers, is undoubtedly the Gerald R. Ford class vessels. This class of newest supercarriers is designed to replace the existing Nimitz-class aircraft carriers by integrating dozens, if not tens of hundreds, of innovative technologies. The U.S. Navy intends to have 10 such aircraft carriers at its disposal, of which currently Gerald R. Ford CVN-78 is already in service, John F. Kennedy CVN-79 is being fitted out and will enter service in 2025, the Enterprise CVN-80 and Doris Miller CVN-81 are in development with service entry dates of 2029 and 2032, respectively. The CVN-82, whose name has not yet been decided, with an approximate commissioning date set for 2036. The U.S. Navy is not yet ready to disclose more precise plans for the remaining Ford-class ships, since everything depends on the budget allocated for the project, as always. So today we're taking a look at the super aircraft carrier John F. Kennedy CVN-79, which has something quite surprising. The first ship, Gerald R. Ford, although a breakthrough, encountered many problems that its successor managed to avoid. 
A contract worth $374 million to prepare for the construction of this giant was received by Northrop Grumman Shipbuilding in early 2009, but before the first steel cutting ceremony in Newport News, Virginia, which marked the official start of construction, the ship and its fans had to wait a little more than two years until February 2011. By the end of 2012, there were construction delays, after which the U.S. Government Accountability Office advised the Navy to delay the detailed design and construction contract for CVN-79 until software deficiencies were resolved. And although the Navy and the Department of Defense unanimously rejected this recommendation, costs for the lead ship Gerald R. Ford CVN-78 had already increased by 22% to an insane $12.9 billion by that time, excluding expenses for its research and development. The reality of the situation became very quickly apparent, which is why the keel of CVN-79 could only be laid at the shipyard in Newport News in 2015. But this didn't stop specialists from improving all work processes for the construction of Ford-class ships, thanks to which, at the time of launch in 2019, the aircraft carrier John F. Kennedy was 70% ready and not 50% as Gerald R. Ford had been at a similar stage for years previously. Thus, during the construction process, the crew was able to avoid the need to carry out complex installation on site, having prepared and assembled 70% of the ship's parts and factories in advance. Another significant reason was digital design, which has rapidly gained momentum since the early 2000s and involves the preliminary simulation of each part in a virtual environment and only after that its manufacture and installation. Now add to this the features of the modular construction principle of the CVN-79, which included the installation of electrical equipment, pipelines, cables, and many other systems on the modules in advance, even before they were installed on the ship. As a result, we get an increased speed of construction, simplification for specialists, and most importantly, a reduction in the overall cost of construction, which is highly approved by the U.S. Congress, especially when it comes to military equipment. Kennedy's dimensions are not far behind its predecessor. The same 1,106 feet long and 256 feet wide with a displacement of 100,000 tons, and the height of its several dozen decks is only slightly inferior to the famous Flatiron Building in New York, 250 feet versus 285. Add to these dimensions enough space to accommodate 90 aircraft, and the result is an almost independent mini U.S. Navy afloat. Among the aircraft in the air wing, you can find the following. Legendary fighters Boeing FA-18EF Super Hornets, brand new Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning II fighters, Electronic Warfare Aircraft Boeing EA-18G Growler, Grumman C-2 Greyhound Military Transports, Northrop Grumman E-2 Hawkeye Early Warning Boards, Sikorsky SH-60 Seahawk and MH-60S Nighthawk Helicopters, and in the future also the MQ-25 Stingray UAV which Boeing's still working on. The steam catapults of the Nimitz-class aircraft carriers in the Kennedy and the Ford-class in general were replaced by the revolutionary Electromagnetic Aircraft Launch System EMALS, as well as Advanced Arresting Gear AAG. EMALS launches aircraft using a catapult that uses a linear induction motor instead of classic steam piston motors, thereby accelerating aircraft more smoothly and placing less stress on their airframes. AAG also uses electromagnets to slow and stop aircraft landing on board an aircraft carrier, and even though current hydraulic braking systems have been tested for decades, if you need to carefully land a UAV on board without damaging it due to extreme loads on the airframe, electromagnets are still the best choice. In addition to the obvious advantages, both systems are more flexible and require less space and personal maintenance. What does this mean? That's right, savings. The most painful spot for Kennedy's predecessor, the USS Ford, was the Advanced Weapon Elevator, AWE, which encountered multiple technical problems due to the change from traditional hydraulics to electromagnets, after which they were also supplemented by delays in certification, which affected the overall readiness of the CVN-78, and most importantly, they spoiled the reputation of the Colossus in most popular media. However, the Junior doesn't have any problems with this especially after the amount of bug fixing done by the team that built CVN-79. Eleven AWS are responsible for more quickly moving ammunition from weapon storage compartments inside the ship to the deck, 
thereby minimizing potential traffic problems in hangars and on the flight deck. According to experts, elevators make it possible to rearm aircraft located on an aircraft carrier in minutes instead of hours. The new systems would hardly have been able to operate for a day without the most powerful nuclear reactors in the history of aircraft carriers, the Bechtel A1B. The supercarrier John F. Kennedy received two of these reactors, providing 27.7% more generating capacity than the A4W reactors built by Westinghouse Electric Company with the need to refuel after more than 25 years, closer to the middle of their service life. Think about it. A4W provides 550 megawatts, while A1B provides 700 megawatts, which allows the U.S. Navy to not only eliminate the use of service steam on the ship, but also by reducing the need for maintenance personnel. However, the main cherry on this cake of electronics in the supercarrier John F. Kennedy was its updated radar system, Enterprise Air Surveillance Radar, ESER. By the way, the fleet intends to equip America-class landing ships with identical radars, starting with the LHA-8 and the planned LXR. ESER was installed instead of the expensive dual-band radar, DBR, which was originally prepared for the futuristic Zumwalt-class destroyers, but after they were abolished, DBR migrated to the lead ship Gerald R. Ford. The difference in the cost of ESER and DBR, according to some sources, was about $180 to $200 million, since the U.S. Ford launch radar cost the U.S. Navy a cosmic $500 million. And the new super aircraft carrier CVN-79 itself was no longer as expensive as its predecessor. The cost of the second ship in the class was estimated at $11.39 billion versus the $12.9 billion price tag of CVN-78. Although it's still unknown just how much money the military will have to request in order to integrate the latest systems in the foreseeable future, things like the combat lasers that the brightest minds of the leading American defense companies are working on at this moment, or electric armor, which is being considered as a potential concept for Ford-class supercarriers and will effectively utilize part of the power generation that their reactors are capable of producing. As we said earlier, the USS John F. Kennedy will have something to surprise us in the next decade. Do you think such colossal aircraft carriers have earned their value and status? Or perhaps you like battleships more? Let us know in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to hit that notification button for more content like today's.